Now you talk about terror. I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Hi, I'm Chris Edges. Welcome to Days of Revolt. Today in a two-part series, we're going to be discussing the great Ponzi scheme that defines the not only U.S. but global economy, how we got there in the first segment, and secondly, where we're going. And with me to discuss this issue is the economist Michael Hudson, author of Killing the Host, How Financial Parasites and Debt Destroy the Global Economy a professor of economics who worked for many years on Wall Street where you don't succeed if you don't grasp Marx's dictum that capitalism is about exploitation. And he is also, I should mention, the godson of Leon Trotsky. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Good to be here. I want to open this discussion by reading a passage from your book, uh, which I admire very much, which I think gets to the core of what you discuss. You write, Adam Smith long ago remarked that profits often are highest in nations going fastest to ruin. There are many ways to create economic suicide on a national level. The major way throughout history has been by indebting the economy. Debt always expands to reach a point where it cannot be paid by large swaths of the economy. This is the point where austerity is imposed and ownership of wealth polarizes between the 1% and the 99%. Today is not the first time this has occurred in history, but it is the first time that running into debt has occurred deliberately, applauded, as if most debtors can get rich by borrowing, not reduced to a condition of debt peonage. So let's start with classical economics who certainly understood this, um, they were reacting, of course, to feudalism. And, and what happened to the study of economics so that it became gamed by ideologues? Well, the essence of classical economics was to reform industrial capitalism, to streamline it, and to free the European economies from the legacy of feudalism. And the legacy of feudalism were landlords that were extracting land rent uh, and living as a uh, class that uh, took income without producing anything. And the banks, which uh, were not funding industry, the leading industrialists uh, from James Watt with the steam engine well, let me, to let the me railroad, just none of them there. could get money well, from, from the From your book, you, you make the point that banks almost never funded industry. That's the point, uh, that they never had. And uh, by the time you got uh, to Marx later in the 19th century, uh, you had uh, a whole discussion, largely in Germany, uh, over how do we uh, make banks do something they didn't do under feudalism. Right now, we're having a, uh, the economic surplus being drained by the landlords and by drained by the, the bondholders. Uh, Adam Smith uh, was very much against colonialism and because that led to wars, and he was against wars because that led to public debt. Uh, and he said the solution uh, to prevent uh, this uh, financial class of bondholders burdening down the economy by imposing more and more taxes on consumers goods every time they went to war was to finance wars on a pay-as-you-go basis. Instead of borrowing, you'd tax the people then. He thought that if everybody felt the burden of war, then uh, in the form of paying taxes, they'd be against it. Well, it took all of the 19th century to fight for democracy and to extend the vote so that instead of the landlords controlling the uh, parliament and the lawmaking and the tax system through the House of Lords, uh, you'd extend the vote uh, uh, to labor, to women, to everybody. So on the theory that uh, society as a whole would vote in its own self-interest and it would vote for the 99% not for the one percent. Uh, and so uh, when by the time Marx wrote in the 1870s, uh, he could al already see what was happening in Germany, that the German banks were indeed making, trying to make money in conjunction with the government by lending to heavy industry, largely to the military industrial This was Bismarck. Uh, Bismarck's that, kind of social, I don't know what we call it, it was a form of 
capitalist socialism. Well, they or called it state capitalism. State capitalism. And there was a long discussion uh, by Engels uh, saying, wait a minute, state capital, state uh, socialism or state capitalism isn't what we mean by socialism. Uh, and there are two kinds of state oriented. But I mean, I mean, I should just interject. I mean, there was a kind of brilliance behind Bismarck's policy because sure. he created uh, pension funds, he uh, provided health benefits. Uh, and he directed banking towards industry, towards the industrialization of Germany, which, as you point out, was very different in Britain and the United States. Well, the German banking was so successful that by the time World War II, World War I broke out, there were discussions in uh, the English journals uh, saying, we're worried that uh, Germany and the Axis powers are going to win because their banks are more suited to fund industry, and uh, without industry you can't have uh, really a military, whereas the, the British banks uh, only lend for foreign trade, they lend for speculation, and the stock market is a hit-and-run operation. Uh, they want uh, quick in and out uh, to, uh, to make the profits, whereas the German banks uh, don't insist that uh, their clients pay as much dividends. Right. The German banks own stocks as well as bonds, and there's much more of a partnership. Uh, and that's what most of the 19th century imagined was going to happen, that the world was on the way towards socializing banking, towards moving capitalism beyond the feudal epoch and getting rid of the landlord class, getting rid of the rent, getting rid of interest, and uh, really it was going to be uh, uh, labor and capital, profits and wages, uh, with the profits being reinvested in more capital, and you'd have an expansion of technology. And uh, around the early 20th century, most futurists uh, imagined that we'd be living in a, a leisure economy by now. Including uh, Karl Marx. Uh, that's right. Yeah, 10 hour work week. And right. to Marx, socialism was just uh, uh, the reformed state of uh, capitalism at the time. And that, that isn't what happened in large part because of the defeat of Germany in World War I. Uh, but also because we took the understanding of economists like Adam Smith and maybe Keynes, and uh, I, I don't know who you would blame for this, whether it's Ricardo or others, and we, we created a fictitious economic form or, or economic theory uh, that erased rentier or, or rent-derived, interest-derived capitalism and counted it as a productive force within the economy. Perhaps you can address that. Well, here's what happened. Marx sort of traumatized classical economics by taking the concepts of Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and the others and pushing them to the logical conclusion. He said that the progressive capitalism, uh, people called Ricardian socialists like John Stuart Mill, said, okay, we want to tax away the land or nationalize it. Uh, we want to have uh, the government take over the heavy industry and build infrastructure to provide low-cost uh, basic services. This was traumatizing uh, the landlord class and the uh, the one percent, and uh, they fought back. Now, none of the classical economists could even imagine how on earth can the feudal interests, these uh, great vested interests, and uh, that had all this money, actually fight back and succeed? They thought the future was going to belong to capital and labor. And around the late 19th century, certainly in America, you had people like uh, John Bates Clark. Uh, come out with a completely different theory. The, the whole classical economics, what made uh, Adam Smith and the physiocrats and John Stuart Mill... Physiocrats, are, you yeah. should explain, are the French... These enlightened French yes, economists. In, uh, yeah. well, the common denominator among all the classical economists was the distinction between earned income and unearned right. income. And uh, the unearned income was rent and interest. The earned income were uh, wages and, right. and, and profits. Well, uh, John Bates Clark came and said, there's no such thing as unearned income. The landlord actually earns uh, the money by uh, taking all this effort to provide a house and a land uh, to renters and the banks that provide uh, credit and uh, uh, they, their interest. Every kind of income is, uh, everybody earns their income. So anyone who accumulates wealth by definition according to his formulas, uh, get rich by adding to what is now called gross domestic product. And I think one of the points you make in your book, which I liked, was that in almost all cases, uh, those who had the capacity to make money parasitically off interest and rent uh, had either, if you go back to the origins, looted and seized the land by force or inherited it. 
That, that's correct. In other words, uh, the unearned income. Well, the result of this uh, sort of anti-classical revolution that you had just before World War I uh, was that today almost all of the economic growth in the last uh, decade has gone to the 1%. It's gone to Wall well, Street, but, real and, estate. And you, and you, but you blame this on what you call junk economics. Well, the junk economics was the anti-classical reaction. And, 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 and explain a little bit how, in essence, that's a fictitious form of measuring the economy. Well, uh, suppose uh, you have a crook and you're taking, you're going to the bank. Uh, I went to a, uh, a block away we had at Chase Manhattan Bank and I used to bank there. I took out money from the bank and uh, as I was going out to, uh, to uh, pickpot, one pushed me over and the other grabbed the money and ran out. Just, I was 10 feet from the teller. Uh, the guard stood there and uh, so I naturally asked for the money back and said, look, I was robbed in your bank right in front. And uh, they said, well, you know, we, we don't arm our guards because if they shot one of the people, uh, he, the, the, uh, the thief could sue us and we don't want to do that. We'll just uh, give you money back. Well, imagine if you count all of this crime, all the money that's taken as an addition to GDP because now uh, the crook uh, has provided the service of uh, not uh, pushing me down or not stabbing me or suppose somebody's held up at an ATM machine, your money or your life. Okay, here's the money. The crook has given you uh, the, uh, the choice of your life. Well, in a way, that's how the gross national product accounts are put up. Uh, you have Wall Street extracting money from the economy. Uh, you have landlords and there, extracting... And let's go back. They're extracting money from the economy by by debt peonage, by raising... But by not playing a productive role, right. basically. So it's uh, credit card interest, mortgage interest car loans, student loans, that's how they make the, the, their funds. Uh, that, that's right. And so they don't, uh, money is not a factor of production. Uh, but in order to uh, have access to credit, in order to get the money, in order to get an education, you have to pay the banks. Uh, right. Uh, and at uh, New York University here, for instance, they have Citibank. Uh, I think a Citibank people uh, were on the board of directors of NYU. Uh, you get the students uh, when they come here to uh, start at the local bank. And once you are in a bank and have monthly uh, funds taken out of your account for uh, electric utilities or whatever, it's very hard to change. Uh, so basically you have uh, what uh, the classical economists called the rentier class, the class that lives on economic rents. Landlords, monopolists are charging more, and uh, uh, the, the banks. So that if you have a uh, a pharmaceutical company uh, such that raises the rate of a drug from $12 uh, a shot to uh, 200 that's all of a sudden their profits go up. Uh, their increased price for the drug is created, uh, is counted in the national income accounts as if the economy is producing more. So all of this presumed economic growth that has all been taken by the 1% in the last 10 years. And uh, people say the economy is growing, but the economy isn't growing. Because it's not it's, reinvested. That's right. It, it, it's, not, uh, it, it's not production. It's not consumption. Right. Uh, the wealth of the 1% is obtained by essentially lending money to the 99% and then charging interest on it and re recycling this interest at a uh, uh, exponentially growing rate. And why is it important, as I think you point out in your book, that economic theory counts this rentier income as productive income. Explain why that's important. If you're a rentier, you want to say that, hey, I earned my income We're by... We're talking uh, about Goldman Sachs, yeah, by the way. Goldman Sachs. is perfect. If you, uh, well, yes, the head of Goldman Sachs came out and said, uh, Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive in the world. That's why they're paid what they are. And the concept of productivity uh, in America is the... In, uh, income divided by the labor. So if you're Goldman Sachs and you pay yourself uh, $20 million a year in salary and bonuses, you're considered to have added 20 million to GDP and that's enormously productive. So we're talking with tautology, we're talking of circular reasoning here. So the issue is whether Goldman Sachs, Wall Street, uh, predatory pharmaceutical firms actually add to product or whether they're just exploiting uh, the people. And uh, that's why I called uh, uh, my book uh, Parasitism uh, because the parasite, uh, people think of the parasite as simply uh, taking money out, taking 
blood out of the uh, uh, host or taking money out of the economy. But in nature, it's much more complicated. Uh, the parasite can't simply come in and take something. First of all, it needs to numb. Uh, it has an enzyme that numbs the host, so the host doesn't even realize the parasite's there. And then the parasites have another enzyme that makes the host, uh, it takes over the host's brain. And it makes the host imagine that the parasite is part of the body, that actually part of itself to be protected. Well, that's basically what Wall Street has done. It's made, it, it depicts itself as part of the economy, not as a wrapping around it, not as external to it, but actually is uh, the part is, that's helping the, uh, the body grow and that actually is responsible for most of the growth when in fact it's the parasite that's taking over the, uh, the growth. So the result is an inversion of classical economics. It turns Adam Smith upside down. It says that the, what the classical economists said was unproductive parasitism actually is the real economy, and the parasites are labor uh, and industry uh, right. that, that get in the way of uh, the what the parasite wants, which is to reproduce itself, not help the host uh, labor and capital. And the reproduce. classical economists like Adam Smith were quite clear that unless that rentier income, you know, the money made by things like hedge funds, was heavily taxed and put back into the economy, the economy would ultimately go into a kind of tailspin. Uh, and, and I think the example of that, which you point out in your book, is what's happened in terms of large corporations with stock dividends and buybacks. And maybe you can explain that. Well, there's an idea uh, in uh, sort of superficial textbooks in the public media that if companies make a large profit, that somehow they make it by being productive. Uh, and Which if, is still in, in textbooks, isn't it? Yes. And also that if a stock price goes up, you're just capitalizing the profits and the stock price reflects the productive role of the company. But that's not what's been happening in the last 10 years. Uh, just in the last two years, 92% of corporate profits in America have been spent either on buying back their own stock or in uh, paying out as dividends to raise the price of and the stock. And explain why they do this. About uh, 15 years ago at Harvard, uh, a professor called Jensen said uh, the way to uh, uh, ensure that corporations are run uh, to make most efficiently is uh, to make uh, the managers uh, increase the price of the stock. So if you give the managers stock options and you pay them not according to you know how much they're producing or making the company bigger or expanding production but uh, the price of the stock then you'll have the corporation run efficiently financial uh, style. So the, uh, the corporate managers find there are two ways that they can uh, increase the price of the stock. Uh, the first thing is to cut back long-term investment and use the money instead to buy their uh, own stock. Just And when you buy your own stock, that means you're not putting the money into capital formation. You're not building new factories. You're not hiring more labor. You can actually increase the stock price by Tempor hiring temporarily. labor. Temporarily. Temporarily, by using the income from the past just to buy the stock, fire the labor force if you can, not, uh, work it more intensively, uh, pay it out as dividends, and that basically is the uh, corporate raiders model. Uh, you use the money to pay off the, uh, the junk bond holders at high interest. Uh, and of course, this gets the company in such trouble after a while, because there's no new investment, markets shrink, that you then go to the labor unions and say, gee, uh, the, this company is really near bankruptcy. Uh, uh, and we don't really want to have to fire you, and the way that you can keep your job is if we just uh, uh, downgrade your pensions, and instead of giving you what we promised, uh, the defined benefit pensions, it's a defined contribution. Uh, you know what you pay every month, but you don't know what's going to come out at all, and so you wipe out the pension funds, push it on to uh, the government, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, and uh, all of a sudden you use the money you were going to pay for pensions to pay the stock dividends and then uh, push it up and then the whole thing turns down and uh, it's hollowed out and you shrink and you collapse, but by that time the managers will have left the company. Right. They will have taken uh, their bonuses and uh, salaries and run. I want to read this quote from your book. Uh, written by David Harvey in A Brief History of Neoliberalism and have you comment on it. The main substantive achievement of neoliberalism has been to redistribute rather than to generate wealth and income. Accumulation by dispossession. I mean the commodification and privatization of land and the forceful expulsion of peasant populations, conversion of various forms of property rights, common collective state, etc., 
into exclusive private property rights, suppression of rights to the commons, colonial, neo-colonial, and the imperial processes of appropriation of assets, including natural resources, and usury, the national debt, and most devastating of all, the use of the credit system as a radical means of accumulation by dispossession. To this list of mechanisms, we may now add a raft of techniques, such as the extraction of rents from patents and intellectual property rights, and the diminution or erasure of various forms of common property rights, such as state pensions, paid vacations, and access to education and health care, won through a generation or more of class struggle. The proposal to privatize all state pension rights pioneered in Chile under the dictatorship is, for example, one of the cherished objectives of the Republicans in the U.S. This explains the kind of denouement or the final end result where, which you speak about in your book, is in essence allowing what you call the rentier or the speculative class to cannibalize the entire society until collapse. Well, a property right is not a, a factor of production. Uh, look at uh, what happened in Chicago, uh, the city where I grew up. Uh, Chicago uh, didn't want to have to raise the taxes on real estate, especially on all of the uh, expensive commercial real estate there. So uh, the budget uh, ran up a deficit. They uh, needed money to pay the bondholders, and so they sold off uh, the parking rights uh, to have meters, uh, you know, along the curbs uh, for the Chicago streets. Well, uh, the result is that uh, they sold to Goldman Sachs a, a 75 years of the right to put up parking meters. So now the, the cost of living and doing business in Chicago was raised by having to pay off the parking meters. If Chicago is going to have a parade or something and block off the traffic, Chicago has to pay uh, Goldman Sachs uh, what it would have made if there wouldn't have been a close off for, uh, par for parade and uh, all of a sudden uh, it's much more expensive to live in Chicago because of this but this added expense of having to pay uh, parking rights uh, to Goldman Sachs to pay out interest to its bondholders uh, is counted as increase in GDP because you've now created more product by charging more. Uh, if you sell off a road uh, a, a government or a local road and you put up a toll booth and make it into a toll, toll road, all of a sudden GDP goes up. Uh, if you go to war abroad and you spend more money on the military, the military industrial complex, is, all this is counted as increased production. None of this is really part of the production system of the uh, capital and labor building more and more factories and producing more things that people need to live and to do business. Uh, all of this is overhead, but there is no distinction between wealth and overhead, and failing to draw that distinction means that the host doesn't realize that there's a parasite there. The host economy, the industrial economy, doesn't realize what the industrialists realized in the 19th century, that if you want to be an efficient economy and be low-priced and sell, undersell competitors, you have to cut your price by having the uh, public sector provide roads uh, freely, medical care right. freely, education freely. If you charge for all of these, then you get to the point that the economy is in, U.S. economy is in today. When if American workers and in, who work for factories were to get all of their consumer goods for nothing, all of their food, transportation, clothing, furniture, everything for nothing, they still couldn't compete with uh, Asians or uh, other uh, producers because they have to pay uh, up to 40%, 43% of their income for rent or mortgage interest, 10% uh, or more of their income for student loans, uh, credit card debt, 15% uh, of their paycheck is automatic uh, withholding to pay uh, uh, Social Security to cut taxes on, on the rich or to pay for medical care. So Americans, uh, you've built into the economy all of this overhead and there's no distinction between growth and overhead and it's all made America so high priced that we're priced out of the market regardless of what trade policy we and have. And we should add that that under this uh, predatory form of economics you game the system. So uh, you privatize pension funds, you force them into the stock market, an overinflated stock market, uh, but uh, because of uh, the way uh, companies are go public, uh, it's the hedge fund managers who profit. And, and, and it's those citizens whose retirement savings are tied to the stock market who lose. And maybe we can just conclude by talking about how the system is fixed, not only in terms of 
burdening the citizen with debt peonage, but by then forcing them into uh, the market to fleece them again. Well, we talked about an innovation economy as if that makes money. Let's uh, suppose you have an innovation and a company goes public. Uh, they go to Goldman Sachs and other companies, uh, Wall Street investment banks, to underwrite the stock. What and uh, they uh, say uh, we're going to issue the stock, say at forty dollars a share. What's considered a successful float is immediately uh, the uh, Goldman and the others will go to their insiders and sa they'll say, you know, will you buy this stock? You'll guarantee it'll go up. A successful flotation doubles the price in one day. So that at the end of the day, the stock's selling but they, for $80. They have the option to buy it before everyone else. Yes. And, and knowing that by the end of the day, it'll be inflated and then they sell it off. That's exactly and right. And so the pension funds come in and buy it at they, an inflated price and right. then it goes back down. Uh, it may go, may go back down, or it may be that the company just was shortchanged from the very beginning. And uh, here, the, here uh, the important thing is that the Wall Street underwriting firm and the, uh, the uh, speculators that come in that it rounds up get more in a single day than all the years it took to put the company together. Right. The, 40, uh, the company gets 40 percent. These people get also $40. Other people get $40. So uh, ba basically, uh, you, you have the financial sector ending up with a much more of the gains. And the name of the game, if you're on Wall Street, isn't profits. It's, uh, it's capital gains. And that's something that uh, wasn't even a part of uh, classical economics. They didn't anticipate that uh, the price of assets uh, would go up for any other reason than earning more money and capitalizing an income. And actually, what you have uh, uh, in the last uh, 50 years, really since World War II, has been asset price inflation. Uh, that most families have, uh, middle class families, uh, have gotten uh, the wealth that they've uh, got since maybe 1945, not really by saving what they've earned at the, by, while working, but by the price of their house going up. They've benefited by this price of the house, and they think that that's somehow made them rich. And uh, the reason the price of the house has gone up is that a house is worth whatever a bank is going to lend against it. And if banks have uh, made easier and uh, easier credit, lower uh, down payments, then you're going to have a financial bubble. And so now you have indeed real estate having gone up as high as it can. Uh, I don't think it can take more than 40% of somebody's income to buy it. But now if you imagine if you're joining the labor force, you're not going to be able to buy a house at today's prices uh, putting down a little bit of your money and then somehow end up getting rich just on the house investment. It, all of this money you pay the bank is now going to be subtracted right. from the amount of money that you have to spend on goods and services. So we've turned the post-war economy that made America uh, prosperous and rich, we've turned it inside out. And uh, uh, somehow the, uh, most people believe that you could get rich by going into debt to borrow something that's going to rise in price. And uh, you can't get rich ultimately in going into debt. Uh, in, in the end, the creditors always win. And that's why every society since Sumer and Babylonia have had to either cancel the debts or you come to a society like Rome that didn't cancel the debts and then you have a dark age. Everything collapses. Uh, and that's the topic of our second discussion, uh, which is where we're headed. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for watching Days of Revolt. Had to eat out the watermelon patch. And you know they put me on a shack.